The future is swallowed by an infinite gray. Tomorrow will be no different from today. Things will never get better. The scorpion stings of consciousness have become my daily bread. Heartbreak, death, depression, panic attacks. Anything is better than staying alive. The darkness calls. Suicide looks impossibly attractive. But these are not my only memories. Prayer beside waterfalls white as moonlight on snow. Friends who saved me from my head. Dreams blossoming into reality. As the cool beauties of life summon me to loftier planes of reality, I choose the light. Five weeks ago, we started the series, and we're wrapping it up today. It's called Flirting with Darkness. It's inspired by a book with the same title, written by best-selling author Ben Corson. And we want to invite you to, to listen to a podcast that I do with Andy King. It's called Revival Town Podcast, where we had the honor to interview him shortly after he was on Good Morning America, and he shares his heart for about an hour about his story. Uh, in greater detail. So we encourage you to get the book. We encourage you to listen to the podcast where he rifles through 11 weapons to help people fight depression, and he is living proof that God does heal people of depression. Amen? Amen. I also want to point out something that I have shared each week, and sometimes God uses counselors. We know that he uses therapists. There's no shame in seeking therapy. Some people are prescribed medicine, and that's okay. God uses it all. A lot of people show up on Friday nights right here for a ministry called Celebrate Recovery. It's for people not just struggling with, with addictions, but with hurts and with hangups. So we encourage you to come Friday night, 6 o'clock, if, if you're able to, if that resonates with you. We just know this. There's hope. Amen? Look at someone next to you and say, there's hope. See, hope is in the house, and because you're a follower of Jesus and his spirit lives in you, there's hope inside your heart. So we're not leaving without hope, and Paul said we are not like people who don't have hope. Amen? So one more time, shout hope. Our foundational scripture, Romans 15, 13, says this, I pray that God, the source of what? Of hope will fill you completely with joy and peace as you trust him. I mean, it's the power of the Holy Spirit will cause that hope to brim over and to overflow. So we are sharing 11 weapons to help you fight depression. And we only made it through two the last two weeks. And I have to go through nine today. So I hope you don't have a roast in the oven. That's all I got to say. No, okay, we're going to let you out here right on time. We're not going to be allowed to spend a lot of time on every single one, so I encourage you to get the book, and I know, I know it'll bless you. I already said that. But um, weapon number one to help you fight depression is prayer. Everybody say pray up. Weapon two, we already talked about it last week, is the Word of God. Everybody say word up. 
So we got pray up, we got word up. Number three, let's get to it. The magic number of greatness. This is what Ben calls the magic number of greatness. And I have to say, I was really disappointed that it wasn't number 41. I just got to tell you that. I mean, I almost just had to put the book down and just walk away. I mean, I'm going to text him and say, listen, Ben, um, you blew it, bro. You, you messed up. If there's a number of hope, I think it's 41. But no, here, here's the number of greatness that he's referring to. It's 10,000. Everybody say 10,000. And you might not have a clue what that means, but let me first, before I explain it, say this. There's greatness inside of you because God created you, and he's a great God. So look at someone next to you and say, there's greatness within you. Tell somebody that. We have to believe that, that there is greatness within us. And Daniel 11.32 says, the people who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. And the reason we can do great exploits is because we serve a great God. And the reason we have greatness within us is because a great God put it there. Because he is the one who created us. But one of the things that Ben Corson shares is that when somebody puts 10,000 hours into something, they will become great at that, all right? So in his book, Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell demonstrated that to be truly great at anything, you have to put in 10,000 hours of practice. This is why there are certain athletes that are head and shoulders above everyone else. It goes beyond natural talent and ability. It comes down to hard work. And that's why the great of the greats get early in practice. They stay late. When nobody else is in the gym, they're in the gym or on the field because they want to be great. Check this out. By age 21, the average American has put 10,000 hours of practice into video games. Now, there's nothing wrong with video games. They can be therapeutic. I play this game called Golf Rival. I love it. I'm addicted to it a little bit. <laughs> um, when I was first married, before Annette and I had kids, I was slightly addicted to this game called Madden Football. Have you ever, ever played that? And, um, and that's, I, I started going to Celebrate Recovery because of it. Yeah, no, okay. Um, but um, I, I remember, I mean, I was seriously, like, addicted to it. And we'd go to bed, and I'd say, hey, I, you know what? I'm just going to play one game. And then she would fall asleep, and I'd, like, play a whole season, <laughs> right? I, I, I finally, I really did. I had to put it away. I put it away. And uh, um, we didn't really have another gaming console until later on with kids, and we just got our first Xbox within the last year. Um, and I kind of stay away from it, right? But I know my limits. No, I, I love to, to, to play NBA with, with my son Ashton. It's a good time. There's nothing wrong with video games, it could be, you know. But um, I tell you what, if we're going to spend 10,000 10, hours with something, it should be doing something that really matters. And it should be something that will be productive. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus confirmed that if we're faithful in the small things, then he'll make its ruler of much. He'll give us more, right? If we're faithful with a little, then he will give us more responsibility. Proverbs 28, 19 says, hard work, everybody say hard work, brings prosperity. Playing around brings poverty, right? How many besides me have ever wasted some time because you're just playing around, right? And there's a time to play, but there's also a time to work. Proverbs 12, 24 says, work hard and become a leader. Be lazy and become a slave. Everybody say, work hard play hard, right? And a lot of times when we work hard, that allows us to take some time to celebrate our hard work. And somebody who celebrated multiple Super Bowl wins was Steve Young. Remember him? Now, I'm a Cowboys fan. I used to hate the 49ers, all right? But Steve, Steve Young, a Hall of Famer. And way back in the day, after they won the Super Bowl, Steve Young, he told the story of how three days after the Super Bowl, he went back to the practice facility. I don't know what he had to grab something, but Jerry Rice was there. And if you don't know who Jerry Rice is, we have, we have a picture for you. 
Um, Jerry Rice is, is arguably the best receiver of all time. Hall of Famer. Three days after winning the Super Bowl, Steve Young goes back to the practice facility, and Jerry Rice was there out on the field running routes by himself. The rest of the team was out celebrating, as they should be. In fact, Jerry Rice probably should have been in Hawaii celebrating, right? But he wanted to be that much greater. There are just certain players that put in extra work, and they end up being so much better. Larry Bird practically lived in the gym. When nobody was there, he was shooting three-pointers. He was there early, and when practice ended and everybody went home, he would stay and make another thousand three-pointers. This is why he could have the confidence to show up All-Star Weekend for the three-point competition, true story, and walk up to all the other contestants and say, so who's coming in second? Right? Right? Everybody say great. Ben Corson says success is doing what others won't do today to have what others can't have tomorrow. So we, we don't want to trade what we want in the future for what we want right now. And if we will put forth some effort and work hard, we can actually work our way out of a slump. We can work our way out of a hole. When we have focus and determination, that can pull us up off the couch and off of and out of our state of depression. So that's a great, great weapon. We got to realize the greatness within us, and let's work hard. All right, number four, the fourth weapon is endorphins, anyone? Now, for anyone who doesn't know what endorphins are, endorphins are, are structurally similar to the drug morphine and considered natural painkillers because they activate opioid receptors in the brain that help minimize discomfort. All right? So if we stay on the couch, we're not going to rise up out of our depression. we got to get up. Look at someone next to you and say, get up. All right? And I already shared this a couple weeks ago, but scientists have determined that jogging for 40 minutes is equivalent to taking an antidepressant, right? And last week, we were in the lobby, and a couple guys, we were talking about this, and I think it was our youth pastor, Corey, said, you know what? I think I'd rather take an antidepressant than go running. <laughs> So here's the deal. You don't, you don't have to run, all right? For me, that's what I chose to do because I was in a depression about a year ago. I was the heaviest I'd ever been, and I, I was struggling. I was tired of, I mean, just our family's been, th- been through some stuff. And I said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run five days a week until October. And I started last July 1st, and I did that through October. And now it's 11 months later. I'm still running four to five times a week. It's been therapeutic. It helps me. You might not like to run. That's okay. You can walk, though, right? We've got to do something, some type of exercise. We're wired that way. God created us to not just sit, but we got to move. we got to move around. I mean, you know, something that's been therapeutic for me um, as my wife is battling her illness is, is I've been cooking more, and I like to grill out, and so... Uh, Savannah and I, we love Indian food, and I, I love Chinese food, and I love Mexican food, and I love food, man. And um, I like meat and barbecue, but um, anyway, so lately, Savannah and I, we've really been into Indian food. So last night, I attempted to make my first Indian dish, butter chicken masala, and um, man, I went to the Indian store, and I, and I, I got all the stuff, and I didn't realize it was going to take, you know, like two hours for me to get it all done. And I, I, I mean, I felt like I had just ran five miles. And I did run five miles yesterday, and then I had cooked for like two hours. So um, I'm going to go take a nap now. Ben, come, come back. And, you know. But point is this. We, we, we have to move. The enemy wants you to stay in your seat. We've got to get up. We've got we to gotta move. All right? So tap somebody say move. All right, number five, we're not going to spend time on this one because we unpacked it pretty heavily in a series we did in February called um, Win the Day. But number five, the fifth weapon is rewrite your story. And there's a lot of people that are in this room and people that are watching right now that don't feel like you can be used by God because of some things you've done in your past. And that's a lie of the enemy. God can rewrite your story right now today. So our past chapters, the past chapters in our life, they don't determine how our story will conclude. Amen? 
So before moving to our next weapon, let me just let me just say this. Because of Jesus, no matter it doesn't matter how bad. I mean, maybe your story's been a horror story up until today, your whole life story. Maybe it's been a horror story. Or maybe it's been a comedy. I don't know what your story is, right? But it doesn't matter what it's been up to this point. Because of Jesus, your story has a happy ending. So one more time, look at someone and say, get up. Number six, our sixth weapon is own your oddness, right? Own your oddness. I mean, we're all peculiar people, right? I mean, all of us are a little bit weird, right? I mean, everybody. So we, we, we want to own that. Ben Corson says this, our oddness comes from God. I love that. So the next time somebody, you know, says to me, man, you're, you're, you're weird, I'm going to be like, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> right? All right, so our oddness comes from God. The very thing that makes you different can help you make a difference. The thing that prevents you from fitting in empowers you to stand out. Your weakness may help others find victory. Amen? So here's something that will prevent that from happening if you fall into the comparison trap. All right, check out this story. Once when Julius Caesar was at leisure in Spain, he was reading about the exploits of Alexander the Great, and suddenly those around him noticed that Caesar just burst into tears. All right, we're talking about at the time the most powerful man in the world. He burst into tears. His companions rushed to his side. They said, man, what's what's the matter? And, And Caesar, a person of almost unimaginable power at the very height of his fame, this is what his response was. Do you not think it is matter for sorrow that while Alexander the Great at my age was already king of many peoples, I have as yet achieved no brilliant success? What's fascinating is this is before there was Instagram, right? He wasn't just scrolling, but he heard about the exploits of Alexander, and he was comparing himself to him. There's always going to be someone better than you, all right? And there's always going to be someone who's not as good as you. That's something. We just got to be who God made us to be, right? He put greatness within us. Let's be who God has called us to be. Because it's been said, don't be jealous of Napoleon because Napoleon was jealous of Caesar. And Caesar was jealous of Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great was jealous of Zeus. And Zeus didn't exist. Right? So look at someone next to you say, don't compare. Experts say that One of the reasons why we are the most depressed generation ever is because of social media. When we sit in our stupor and we scroll and we see all the picture-perfect images and we begin to compare ourselves with what others have done and are accomplishing, it makes us slouch down even lower. But here's the deal. We need to be satisfied with how God created us. Psalms 139, 13 says, You, God, made all the delicate inner parts of my body. God, you're the one who knit me together in my mother's womb. This means there are no accidents in this room. There are no accidents watching the live stream right now. God is the one who saw us. And here's what's so cool. He thinks about us constantly. Psalms 139, verse 17 says, How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They can't even be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you're still with me. God is thinking about you. And the word says that Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for you. So God is thinking about you. You're always on his mind. Jesus is praying for you and cheering you on. He's already placed greatness within you. Get up! Right? Let's embrace who God created us to be. We can flip the script. We can allow him to rewrite our story. Our future can be better. Our story does have a happy ending because we serve a God who is greater than the depression that we're in. If we don't believe that, Man, we're doomed. Comedian Jim Carrey said this, depression is your body saying, all righty then. No, it's not, that's the wrong quote. (laughs) Depression is your body saying, I don't want to be this chapter anymore. 
I don't want to hold up this avatar that you've created in the world. It's too much for me. We need to embrace who we are. Don't, don't put on a mask. Don't hide. Be you. Tap somebody say, be you. Ben Corson says, people might be impressed with you because of your strengths, but they connect with you because of your weaknesses. I don't know about you, but I always resonate with somebody. When I'm struggling with something and then I hear somebody else, especially somebody that I looked up, up to, when they're transparent and they share their struggles, it makes me feel better about my own struggle, right? And some of you are beating you up because of some of the things that you've been through. You know, God's going to use you to deliver hope to somebody else in your future. So there's good news today. All right, our, ne- our next one, number seven. So we need God, and we need to be who he called us to be. But we're going to find out that we also need each other. You need more than God. I mean, to get to heaven, all you need is God. He's, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, only Jesus. All right, but if you want to have a better life until you're going to be with him forever, then you need people. You can't isolate yourself. You can't live a- alone. Don't do, don't do life alone. Anytime I perform a wedding, I always share this. In Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, and he said it was good. And six times in Genesis chapter 1, God creates something, and he calls it good. So we got good, 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 good. Everybody say good. good. And when his work was complete, he said it was very good. So, man, you're reading this chapter. Man, you're up, right? Yeah, yeah, this is good. And then you get to chapter 2, and God says something's not good. Like, wait, wait a minute. Not good. We got good, 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 good. Very good. Not good. That's not good. Right? He said, it's not good for man to be alone. It was just Adam in the garden with the animals. And here's what I want to point out. Adam had a relationship with God. But God said it's not good for man to be alone. God was with him, but God recognized that Adam needed a companion. I mean, animals are great. I love animals. But they can't replace people. We we, we need each other. I mean, I have a a little Yorkie pool, Yorkie poo. She's a little over a year old. Her name is Dixie. Man, she's crazy. And she is hyper. If somebody comes to the door, she loses her mind because she loves people. I mean, and she has to just jump on them and lick them and just goes crazy when people walk by she just goes she goes nuts when she hears our garage door she knows somebody's home and she jumps on the back of the couch and she's waiting and she's ready to pounce because she's just crazy right and, and, and she loves people and she and she also loves to sleep she sleeps with my daughter every night and even this morning when I had to go take her outside she did not want to budge <laughs> she's like some of us right <laughs> leave me alone and I, I I put her harness on and collar and I mean her her um, a little rope, and we go outside, and she wouldn't budge. I was, like, dragging her. <laughs> so I had to pick her up and take her to the grass so she would pee. And then she went right back in and went to sleep. And she's great. But she can't replace people. God created us to do life together, to take friend adventures, not just adventures, but friendships. See, God uses people to help you heal. God has used me. He has used people. He has used people to help me, is what I was going to say. For 23 years of pastoring this church, I would not be standing here today without people in my life, without God sending the right people. I mean, everybody turn around. That's in this room. I mean, if you're home, you don't need to turn around. Huh? But everybody in this room, I want you to turn around, and I want you to to look at OJ in the sound booth. Well, he's not there. I don't see him. Never mind. But I'm sure he's got the soundboard on the iPad remotely. You don't see him, but he's on stage often. He's got a long beard. A lot of you know who Jason is. And what you may not know is Jason and his wife, Sarah, who's emceeing today. You'll see her at the end of the service. They've been a part of our church family all 20 years three years in leadership on our executive team, and Annette and I wouldn't have made it without her, and I wouldn't have made it without our our staff. I call Pastor Chris like four times a week. I think sometimes when he pulls out his phone and he sees it's me, he hits ignore. (laughs) Brother, check's gone again, and 
been on our staff, we, we have to talk a lot because he doesn't live in the area. And when I'm out running, he has to hear, sounds like a horse running and breathing and me huffing and puffing as we're, as we're talking. But I mean, we've been friends for so long, I, I wouldn't make it without him in my life. I've done a lot of road trips with OJ, and I've taken several ministry trips to Arizona and back with our worship pastor, Lance, our youth pastor, Corey, and I've needed those moments. I've needed that time. We have such a great team and staff. There are six pastors on this team. It's not just me. We have uh, not just our pastoral staff, but our whole staff. We, we love each other, do life each other. We don't just love each other. We like each other, right? God has blessed me with, 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 with friendships to pour into me and to encourage me and to lift me up. And even my wife, as she's going through this struggle, not only does she need me and my family, but there, there are a group of ladies with our church. They have this app, and they all they, they message her every day, and they send her YouTube videos, and they send her scriptures, and they encourage her. You know what they're doing? They're holding up her arms. We need people. Look at someone next to you and just say, I need you, right? I mean, don't creep them out, but <laughs> like, yeah, I need you, and I need to leave. I'll see you. I'll pray for you. Now, there are some people that we do need to distance ourselves from, because there are some people that will destroy you. There are some people you need to cut off. You need to get them out of your life. You need to love them from a distance, because 1 Corinthians 15, says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You might have some people in your life that are keeping you down. And if you want to get out of your depression, you want to be healed from a depression, you got to surround yourself with the right squad. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. We need friends. Deuteronomy 32, 10 says that one can put 1,000 of flight, two can put 10,000 of flight. So by, by biblical math, we see that two are 10 times more powerful than one. Again, we need each other. Andy King and I interviewed our friend Bill Allison on our podcast just a couple days ago. It'll be released the day after Father's Day. He's a dad of seven kids, and he has a ministry where he raises up disciple makers. He raises up more disciple makers. And we talked about how important it is to have community and to connect. And, and he brought out a scripture that I've read before, but when he shared it on our podcast, it just jumped out at me. John 3, verse 22 says, Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem, and they went into the Judean countryside, and Jesus spent some time with them there. Jesus always took time to seek solitude with the Father but 23 times in the Gospels, Jesus does some type of getaway with only his disciples. We need each other. We need people. We need a posse. We need a friend that we can speak into and that they can speak into us. 23 years of, 23 years of Rock Church, there's community connection, and that's why I'm so glad we brought the meet and greet back. We need that high five. It's one minute, 60 seconds, the most important 60 seconds probably of, of this service outside of when we're leading people to Jesus. So we gotta, we got to make that connection. After first service, I was back in the lobby shaking hands and, and being present. That's so, so important. We have a ladies' Bible study here twice a week, Monday night, Thursday morning. There's opportunities to connect with others. We're starting a men's breakfast Saturday. We're going to do it twice a month, and the focus is not going to be Scripture. The focus is going to be fellowship. Because we need to do life together. It's hard to get up without people. Number eight, as we get ready to close, heaven. Everybody say heaven. Say it one more time, heaven. You see, Paul says we're not like people who live without hope. We know no matter how bad things get, someday God's going to wipe every tear from every eye. There won't be any more crying, no more death. No more chemo, no more cancer, no more sickness, no more prescriptions. No more bad drivers slowing down at yellow lights. <laughs> Man, no more getting pulled over twice in under two minutes. Romans. 818 says, 
suffering that we're encountering today can't be compared to the glory that will be revealed in the future. And God's going to help us while we're here, but we know we look forward to heaven. J.R. Tolkien wrote, there is a place called heaven where the good here unfinished is completed and where the stories unwritten and hopes unfulfilled are continued. In John chapter 11, verse 26, it says this, and whoever lives by believing in me, Jesus said, will never die. Never. Everybody say never. And then he asked Martha, do you believe me? Because she was distraught because her brother Lazarus was dead. Now Jesus raised him from the grave. But what Jesus is saying, whoever lives in me and believes in me is going to live with me forever and ever. That's the hope we have, and God has placed a hope within our heart because Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. Our souls are hardwired for eternity. Are you going to spend eternity with God or away from God? I want to spend it with them because when you're with them, there's no more tears and no more death, no more sickness. Psalms 311 says, you have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You have taken away my clothes of mourning, and you have clothed me with joy. That is the God that we serve. Today, he can pull you out of your stupor. And he can put joy in your heart because he is number nine. He is Elroy, the God who sees the God who sees. Look at someone next to you and say, he sees you. I don't have time to read the whole story. You can read it in Genesis chapter 16. But you know, remember, Abraham was married to Sarah, and they were old, and God promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations. But he thought to himself, I'm old. How is this going to happen? How is my wife going to get pregnant? Sarah laughed when she heard God say this. Like, right? She's like, the only way this is going to happen is if you sleep with my servant. And it's interesting that Abraham said, okay. And she got pregnant with Ishmael. Ishmael means God hears. But here's what happened after Hagar got pregnant, and it was Sarah's idea. Sarah turned on her. There was contempt in her heart. And she was horrible to be around, and she treated Hagar really, really bad. So bad that Hagar was in a depression, and she was distraught. It wasn't her idea. And she was weeping, and she was broken, and God sent an angel with a message. And after she had that encounter, here's what she said in Genesis 16, verse 13. You are the God who sees me. Elroy in the Hebrew. The God who sees, and he sees you. And he sees me. And everyone who's watching right now, God sees you. You might, you might not be expecting that. Maybe you didn't expect to hear that. God sees you. He's seen the tears. Even though some of you are holding on to stuff that nobody else knows about. And it's eating you alive and you feel like nobody sees you. God sees you. And he's going to heal your heart. So number 10, our, our 10th weapon is let God love on you. God radically loves us, amen? I don't have the time to tell the story. You can, you can read about it in John chapter 4, the woman of the well, Samaritan woman. Jews and Samaritans hated and despised each other. Jesus was not supposed to be talking to a Samaritan, let alone a woman. And the Chosen TV show does such, does such a great job of this. You need to watch season one. It's either episode seven or eight. I don't remember now. But you see the love that Jesus has for the woman at the well. The disciples, they were shocked when they came back and they saw Jesus talking to her in John 4, 27. It says they were thinking about this, but none of them have the nerve to ask, why are you talking to her? And the reason was because he loved her. And he loves you. And after first service, I had an elderly woman come up to me with tears in her eyes. And she said, I'm the woman at the well. I'm the woman at the well. 
And she's going to be with Jesus forever because God loves her. And she responded to the love. A.W. Tozer said, what I believe about God is the most important thing about me. You see, love is not love. God is love. And he loves you. God, look at someone next to you and say, God loves you. Our final weapon is something Ben Corson calls dreamality. Not just reality, but dreamality. We need to have a vision for our life. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there's no vision, people perish. Psalms 20, verse 4 says, may the Lord give you the desire of your heart. Psalms 21, 2 says, you, God, have granted him his heart's desire. Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalms 145, 19 says, he fulfills the desires of those who fear him. Proverbs 10, 24 says, what the righteous desire, they will be granted. And Proverbs 13, 12 says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. We need to dream again. Because God has so many great things for us. I look back, 23 years ago, we didn't know what the future held. We didn't know who was going to show up for church. We just had a vision within our heart. And we had t-shirts to hand out. And on the back of those t-shirts was a scripture verse. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. It was a dream that Jesus had for the church. And he flipped the script in Peter's life. And he said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell cannot stop it. Hashtag, we're tougher than hell. We can get up. The gates of hell can't stop us. And we think gates, we think that that means that when the enemy is attacking us, that we're just going to be able to withstand him. What this means is that we're on the offensive and the gates of hell cannot stop you from going forward. You can get up and the gates of hell cannot stop you. I think there's a bonus weapon too. It's not in the book, but it's worship. We can worship our way out of the wilderness. We can worship our way out of a mess. So I'm going to ask you to stand up. Now, we haven't done this in about a year and a half. But here's how I'm going to close today. If you're broken, if you're hurting, if you're depressed, if you're suffering from anxiety, you're in a hard season, these guys are going to do the chorus of the hope song again. There is hope. And during the song, I want you to get out of your aisle that you're in, and I want you to come and stand down in front and just lift your hands and sing the song. And when the song is over, I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to have everybody out here stretch your hands out, and we're just going to pray together. And for those of you at home, you can just stretch your hands out towards the TV, and we believe that God's going to touch you even though you're not here physically. Because God is a God of hope, and he cares about you. So we're not leaving today until we do this. All right? So during this song, again, if you want prayer, and you don't have to physically step out. If you don't feel comfortable, stay where you're at. Just put your hands straight up. God knows, right? But God is here. Help is here. Hope is here. Amen? Amen. All right.
everyone that's here. God, I thank you for these that have stepped out of their comfort zone. They don't care what anybody thinks. They just know they need a touch from you. And I thank you, God, that you're here to touch us. God, those that are watching that can't be here and they desperately need a breakthrough, they need a miracle, I thank you that you are the source of our hope. Your word tells us in Psalms 34, 18, that, God, you come close to the brokenhearted. You rescue those whose spirits are crushed. And I, God, I know there are people here, up front, and in this room, and at home, whose spirits are crushed, and they need a breakthrough. They need a fresh touch from you. They need you to wrap your arms around them and feel your presence and your love. And I just pray, God, that you will minister to hurts, that you will minister to hearts. And I thank you, God, it doesn't matter how we feel. We're not going to live by how we feel. We're going to live by what your word says. And your word says when we are weak, Jesus, you are strong. Psalms 23, 4 says that even when we go through the darkest valleys, you are with us. That we don't stay in those valleys. That you help us through them. So I thank you, God, that you are with us and you're going to help us through them in Jesus' name, that you're going to surround us with the right people to hold up our arms. God, those who desire to have friendships. God, those who sat here today in the service and watched at home and they are sad because they don't have a posse and they don't have a squad and they don't have a friend. I thank you, God, that you are setting up divine appointments to fill that void in Jesus' name. That we are leaving with hope in our heart. God, your word says... And Joel, let the weak say, I am strong. So right now, God, by faith, we declare, I am strong. Everybody say that. I am strong. One more time. I am strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm so proud of you guys. You guys can head back to your seats. Can we give the, these guys a hand?